Right. Dear Heavenly Father, and I thank you for the blessings you have given us that we can gather again today to worship and learn. Please send your spirit to uh, give me the words to speak that you would have me to speak and just help us to be able to understand these things. Amen. All right. So now we come to, in this study of the chronology, to the topic of the Jubilee which I hope will help to clarify some things about the chronology and questions about it. So, Jubilee is, uh, kind of means uh, the shouting. In Leviticus 25, 8 through 10, we see, And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And you shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be a Jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. The first Jubilee... And the word is in Hebrew is true wa, and it's from ruwa, but true wa means an acclamation of joy through trumpets or shouting. Ruwa is to split the ears with a shout for joy. So it's like a very, very loud shout sound. And that is the word that's used in Job 38, verses 4 and 7. When it's, uh, and when God asks Job, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of men shouted for joy. So we see at the creation of the world, the sons of God shouted for joy with this ruah, this very loud splitting your ears with a very, very loud shout of joy, right? Um, that's where the word jubilee is derived from. And it is an acclamation of joy through trumpets or shouting. And you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall the fiftieth year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. Levit Leviticus 25, 10 through 13. Uh, in here, the jubilee word is yaobel. I don't know if I'm saying these words correct. <laughs> so it means the trumpet and the festival introduced. Your pastor, just a second. Sure. So, in all other instances in Leviticus, in, in the following verses, it's always, uh, you know, basically the festival of the Jubilee. Um, and it's pointing back, of course, then to the original uh, Jubilee, the shouting. So, I believe so, yes. So we can see that it is a memorial of creation, that the sons of God shouted for joy at creation with an ear-splitting sound, and that the trumpet of the Jubilee is an acclamation of joy through trumpets, and then the Jubilee is the festival introduced by trumpets. To me, it's all pointing back to creation. And as a memorial of creation, we can see, well, the land is not to be sold forever, and there in Leviticus 25. Uh, why? Because the Creator owns the lands, and it reminds us of that. Uh, and returning the lands to the original owners in the 50th year, well, again, the Creator owns the land. And uh, on the sixth year, there was a blessing on the land. 
So, you know, the Creator provides for us, and uh, we're not to sow the seventh year. Yeah, we need to take and have faith in Him that He can provide for us. And the slaves that are returning free, well, they're returning to their original state at creation. So, again, it's, it's all pointing back towards creation. Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever sinneth committed sin. Whomever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. John 8, 34 through 36. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the sea shore innumerable. Hebrews 11, 11 and 12. So this work of faith resulted in life being created from, in someone who was as good as dead. They were dead. So here in Ephesians 4.24, we see that, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So deliverance from sin comes from God creating within us his righteous character. So again, um, deliverance is pointing back to creation. So the sinners are slaves. The Creator sets us free. Faith created life from the dead, and the new nature, therefore, is created. Again, uh, the Jubilee is the memorial of creation that looks forward to setting sinners free by creation of a new nature within them through faith. In Genesis 2, we see that God rested on the Sabbath at creation. Then he gave the command at Sinai in Exodus 20, verse 10, and the word there is Shabbat, the Sabbath. We know that the Sabbath command is a memorial of creation because it begins with remember the Sabbath day goes through creation six days, you know, God created the heavens and the earth and he rested the seventh day. So the Sabbath itself is a memorial of creation, pointing us back to that time. The Jubilee lands on a Sabbath year and the word there is Shabbat, the same, the Sabbath. So the idea is that there's a sabbatical cycle, six years of planting, on the earth, and the seventh year is a Sabbath of the land. The Jubilee starts on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 23:32, And the Day of Atonement is the only feast that is referred to as the Shabbat. All the others are uh, Sabbatones. So, something about the Day of Atonement, the Seventh-day Sabbath, and the yearly Sabbaths, you know. To me, there's something special about them that they would be referred to as the Shabbat. And again, the Jubilee is a Shabbat, and as such, was given at creation and is a memorial of creation. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days. And ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Leviticus 23, 15 through 16. So, let's just say that the feast landed on the seventh day Sabbath. 
And so from the morrow after the Sabbath would be a Sunday. And you are to count seven Sabbaths of time unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. We know that that time period is a period of 49 days. Yet they're told to reckon it as 50 days. This is what is called inclusive numbering. Inclusive numbering. So the day that they were starting from, um, day one was the morrow after the Sabbath. They included that date in the count. And so in modern times, we would say, well, that's, you know, if you're standing on Sunday, 49 days from now would be the Sunday where it was celebrated, but they were to count the current day they were standing on. So it's inclusive numbering. So a time period of 49 can be reckoned as 50 days. Okay. okay. Are you suggesting that um, Leviticus, uh, not Leviticus, that the Jubilee one an additional year on top of the 49th? We'll get there. Okay. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Leviticus 25, 2. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month, that even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Joshua 5, 10 through 12. So the land was planted by the Canaanites uh, as the children of Israel were coming up. Um, and there was a double blessing, I believe, that year. Because in the first year, when the Israelites were there, they were fighting and conquering, and they wouldn't have had time to plant. And so they had to have eaten out of the fields. And so the first year that they came in would have been a Sabbath year. And then that kicks off a cycle. Six years shalt thou sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord in thy harvest thou shalt not reap, neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed. For it is a year of rest unto the land, and the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee and for thy servant and for thy maid and for thy hired servant and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee. Leviticus 25, 3 through 6. Notice the parallels there to the seventh-day Sabbath. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. Exodus 28 through 11. So the, daily, the weekly Sabbath begins with six working days, and it ends with a Sabbath day. So the yearly cycle begins with six working days and the seventh, six working years, six planting years, and the seventh year is the Sabbath. The weekly cycle is continuous. It goes from Sabbath and then it immediately starts the count again. So you can count off periods of weeks, and they're always going to land on multiples of seven. And so the same idea would be there for the 
yearly Sabbath, that it was a continuous cycle, just like the weekly Sabbath, that was to continue on without breaking and interruption. So the Jubilee cycle then is, and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Leviticus 25, 8 through 10. So the first year in Canaan was the first Shabbat. The cycle is 49 years. And the 50th year is the eighth Shabbat, if you will. It's a new beginning. Following the principle of the Feast of Weeks, inclusive numbering would reckon the cycle is 50 years, but the first and 50th year would be shared. They'd be the same. And so the cycle begins and ends on a Shabbat. Cycle's 49 years. But they're standing on this Shabbat, and they're counting from that day, 49, that leads you up to a Friday, the sixth year in the sabbatical cycle, and then the 50th would be the Jubilee. And then you move to the new Jubilee, and you're standing on that, and then you count off 49 days again. So it's a 49-year cycle, but it's reckoned as 50 years because you're including the first Shabb uh, Shabbat in it. The first year is the 50th year in the Jubilee cycle. So it's being counted, yes, twice. And if you shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And ye shall sow the eighth year, and eat of the old fruit until the ninth year, until her fruits come in. Ye shall eat of the old store. Leviticus 25, 10 through 22. So notice that the sixth year is a blessing, gives you a bunch of extra food, and you would not sow on the seventh year, but on the eighth year, you would sow. This command is with, in the middle of the uh, topic of the Jubilee. That's the context. And there is no other verse that says, well, at the 50th year, you're going to have two Sabbaths back to back, and you're going to have to sow the sixth year and not the seventh, nor the eighth, and then plant the ninth. There, this promise is not given that way for the 50th year cycle. So the evidence there is because it's not repeated for the Jubilee itself that the, there is no back-to-back -back Sabbath years. Thus, the first and 50th year has to be shared, and the Jubilee is a 49-year cycle. It would be one year no planting, two years no planting, the third year still you know, the harvest you would get the harvest. Almost three years. So the command here is that the blessing was on the sixth year. You didn't sow the seventh year, but you sowed the eighth. And it lasted you into the ninth. Leviticus 25, verse 22. 25. 25. So the idea is that from the sixth year until the ninth year, you had enough food. And 
with last year. But you served the eighth year. No. No, the Jubilee year lands on the seventh year in the sabbatical cycle. Let's talk the numbers. I'm a number person. Okay. Number 48 is number six, right, of a Sabbath week. Number yes. 49 is number seven. That's correct. Oh. Um, correct. Uh, uh, it's also no, a seven, no, no, so no, it will because... have a seven number and a six, a 49, a Jubilee number. No, no. The um, Jubilee's count starts on a... Sabbath, but the first week starts on so the the Sunday in the count would be on the second day. <laughs> so it's four cycle. It's seven cycles of seven, right? That's correct. So seven, fourteen, twenty-one, twenty-eight, thirty-five, forty-two and we're headed down to 49. But number, year number 50, 48 is year number six of that cycle, mm -hmm. right? No. <laughs> <laughs> because I count seven, I multiply seven times seven and get 49. In creation, was there seven years leading up to the sabbatical year? Creation? Creation started on a sabbatical year. Right, and, and that's then fine. the count and started after that, one, two, three, four, five. So, but in the, you were talking about a sabbatical cycle versus a jubilee cycle. It's different. The, the sabbatical cycle is within the jubilee cycle, but day one of the jubilee cycle is not day one of the sabbatical cycle. Right. Okay, I'll, I'll draw it out. Okay, you draw it out, and then I can try it out, too. Jubilee is... Jubilee is... Thank you. Deep, right? Well, uh, jubilee is... <laughs> I know. Um, yes, so at creation, we'll give this a star because it's a jubilee, but it's our first day in the cycle of the jubilee cycle. That's your creation year right there. Yes, we're talking years. God has this plan, right? Like well, I mean, right, God created the world. Creation was, you know, is ready to eat. Everything was there. So creation was a Sabbath year. I mean, he had the Sabbath week within creation, right? He, he uh, created for six days and then rested the seventh day, but he didn't work for six years and then rest the seventh year. He started with a rest. It seems like it would, it seem, to me it makes more sense that he would start on the first year of the cycle because he's creating something. Why would you create a whole world on the Sabbath year when land is resting? But I don't know. We created it at the very beginning of the year and, and then they had the entire year to rest. And we say that we work six days and rest the seventh, but according to the creation cycle, we start out with uh, getting, getting um, a rest with God and getting spiritual food, and then we're ready to work the six days. That's right, so yeah. actually the cycle starts Sabbath, work, you're ready to work, Sabbath, work. That's when they got married on the first day of their life on the Sabbath. Yeah. And so that is the getting ready for the cycle 
year, day. Yeah, 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 from the human standpoint. Exactly, the first day was Sabbath for them, the first full day. So then we have a period of seven. Seven. So first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth, sixth, and this is the seventh, so this is a Sabbath, right? Yep. We got that one. All right. But in the Jubilee cycle, it's this is the first year, so this is the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. And then it repeats here. And it continues on until, let's just say this is the last one, right? Well, I understand why you're getting it now. Seven. You call Sunday number two and you call Friday number seven. This would be reckoned as the 50th year. This would be 49, 48. So from this point, from here to here is a span of 49 years. But inclusive numbering, including the starting Sabbath, as the starting Jubilee in the Jubilee cycle, then the 50th year is a Jubilee, but there was only 49 year time span between the two because they're counting the first Jubilee cycle. some in Ellen White that goes along with this. Uh, this is from the chap chapter 51, talking about care for the poor. Uh, a couple paragraphs down. It says, every seventh year special provision was made for the poor. The sabbatical year, as it was called, began at the end of this harvest at the seed time, which followed the gathering. The people were not to sow. They should not dress the vineyard in the spring. They must expect neither harvest nor vintage of that which the land produced spontaneously. They might eat while fresh, but they were not to lay up any portion of it in their storehouses. The yield of this year was to be free for the stranger, the followers, the widow, and even the creatures of the field. And then here, here she comments on the verse you're talking about here. But if the land ordinarily produced only enough to supply the wants of the people, how were they to subsist during the year when no crops were gathered? For this, the promise of God made ample provision. And this is quoting Leviticus 25, 21, and 22. It says, I will command my blessing on the year in the sixth year, he said, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years, and he shall sow the eighth year and eat yet of the old fruit until the ninth year, until our fruits come in, he shall eat of the old store. She's quoting the Bible. Yeah, she's quoting the Bible. Okay. So I'm a little confused. After this first um, Jubilee cycle at the beginning of creation, since then, is the cycles 49 years or 50 years? It's 49 years. 49 years. And so then the Jubilee year is the first year of the, of the 49 year cycle. The 50th year is the first year. Right. That's so was... Yeah, so it's okay. called inclusive numbering. Okay. And, and we get that concept from the Feast of Weeks because they reckon it as a period of 50 days even though it's only 49. And they're doing that by including the first day in the count. So it's a 49-day span, but you include the first day. Inclusive numbering makes it a 50-year a cycle. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then the land shall keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. So we've already read this. Um, 
The idea is that the land wasn't planted again by the Canaanites on their end. It was planted on the entrance year, the first year that they were in, the year that was counted as the first year, there was fighting and so they weren't able to plant. That was a Shabbat year. The land was reverting back to its rightful owner, which is Abraham's seed. So the first year was a Jubilee year when they entered into Israel. Um, so remember, the concept is when a king died in the middle of the year, his reign was credited up until the end of that year. So the Israelites came in to Canaan at the middle of the year. They started conquering. The Canaanites would have been credited with reigning up until the end of the year. And then the Israelites, their first year would have been the Jubilee year. So the exodus occurred in... Uh, 2477, when Moses was 80 years old. We get that from Exodus 7, verse 7. Moses died when he was 120 years old. That's Deuteronomy 34, verse 7 through 9. And so the entrance year, the year they came into Canaan, was 2517. Yes. Yep. Would you, would you mind calling the, the reference about for me again? Yes. That's, um, I don't know how to make it bigger in the presentation. Sorry. Okay, so it's uh, Exodus 7, verse 7. Moses was 80 when they came out of Egypt. Deuteronomy 34, verse 7 through 9. Moses was 120. He died right before they went into Canaan. So from our study of the chronology, we know that they came into Canaan on the year 2517. So it's 2477 plus 40 gets you 2517. And so their first year would have been 2518. And those numbers are from? From when they started counting time. Yeah. I think so. Could you say what you said? Oh, uh, yeah, the question was uh, did. Oh. We'll get there, but uh, did did uh, the counting start from sin? And I believe it did start from sin. The counting of time started from sin, I believe. So I have a question. I hope it's not too unrelated. Sure. I'll give you the mic. Thank you. Um, what I struggle with a little bit is Pentecost. Is it 49 days or is it 50 days? Would, could that be comparable to... That's the feast Reckoning of weeks. the Jubilee. That's why I taught, yeah, that's the Feast of Weeks. So the, from the morrow after the Sabbath, you count seven Sabbaths until the morrow after the Sabbath, which is 49 days. But they told us it was 50 days. And so inclusive numbering was included the first, the, from the first morrow after the Sabbath. It included that. So a period of 49 days is reckoned as 50 because they're including the first. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's, that's the pattern set up from, from Pentecost. Yeah. In, in other words, 
maybe this makes it a little easier to understand. If Pentecost is on a Sunday, I mean, if first fruits is on a Sunday, that's when you start your count, and that day is day one. Seven weeks later, Pentecost is also on a Sunday, even though, and you counted 50 days. If, if first fruits is on a Wednesday, seven weeks later, Pentecost will be on a Wednesday. That's seven weeks, but it's 50 days, because first fruits you counted as day one. If you count it out on a calendar, uh, it made it easier for me. I counted, took my calendar and literally one, two, three. Yeah. And if whatever day first fruits is on, Pentecost will be on the same day, seven weeks later. Because day one is first fruits. It's called inclusive reckoning. Whereas with us in our culture, we would have normally say first fruits is on a Sunday. We would count day one as Monday. But they counted day one as the Sunday. That's correct. So you have stated that you're counting the reckoning of time from the start of sin, correct? Yes. And in this illustration, you're starting counting from the date of creation. The which Jubilee was cycle. The Jubilee cycle Correct. prior to sin. Correct. So therefore, I think you have a one year difference there. Because here, one is the Sabbath, the year of rest. And in sin, we would assume that it wasn't a seven, it would start on a, a Sunday, right. you know, seven week count cycle and start counting. So then that would put the num the inclusive number would be at 49 instead of one. But the Jubilee is pointing back to creation. The Sabbath is pointing back to creation. The yearly Sabbath cycle is pointing back to creation. You wouldn't count the beginning of sin as one in any of those cycles. The week of creation. The week of creation also counts that it ended the count on seven, so the very next day would have been the beginning of work and the beginning of the next seven. So it would have been one. Right. We don't know when they sin. We don't know when they sin. And we don't know how long it was from sin or from creation until sin. So, which, starting at creation, which is the first working day of the week? This was when they first started their next seven. So they got up after Sabbath, after the rest, after the end of creation with God, and they started six. So this is day one, right? In the sabbatical cycle. So then, is this the day that they prepare for the Sabbath? Or is this the day they prepare for the Sabbath? That's the six. Which six? There's two up here. Not in the, a weekly cycle, but in the Jubilee cycle. We, we, time started, we don't know when. Because that we don't know when they sit. Could have been day 63. Okay, so between a weekly Sabbath and a Jubilee, there's two different sixes? Um, okay. Because there's a six so, here and there's a six here. This six corresponds with five. And the same with the seven. This seven corresponds with the laboring day. Wrap around to the next week. It starts over at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But the jubilee days keep on going. And the Correct. Count keeps so on when you get up. down here to the jubilee, you're telling me on year 48, which is year is which is day five of the week. In the weekly cycle. Of a week of Sabbath. This That's is correct. the one we would plant, 
and God would give us three years. No, you plant on the sixth day. This one? Yep. But it, this is the 48 one. This is the 49. This is a seven. The 50th. The 50th is where the Jubilee lands on. Anyway, I, I am just concerned that this is staggered because seven sevens, I, I, I don't understand how. The reckoning does not jive to me that, that this is where seven is falling for us to prepare for the three years of blessing under a five instead of under a six. And I'll let you continue explaining. Okay. There are two other dates that the Bible gives us that are likely Jubilee years. So in Ezekiel 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Chibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity. So, normally when they say 30th year, well, they state fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. So that would be, or you could say in the fifth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, right? They're always tying the years to something. But in this case, it's not being tied to anything at all. So the question that scholars have asked is, what is it? The 30th year of what? Jubilee cycle. 30th year of the Jubilee cycle is what they believe. And that would put it in the 18th year of Josiah. And we know that in the 18th year of Josiah, they were refurbishing and cleaning out the temple. They discovered the law. They read the law. They saw all the curses that they had, you know, written in Deuteronomy 28, and that they had been violating the law. And they said, oh, my goodness, um, you know, is it too late? Go inquire of God for us. And he came back and said, yeah, it's, it's too late. But Josiah went on to work a great reformation in Israel, and he killed off all the idolatrous priests, and he broke down all the idols and the places of worship, and had a great reformation. And after that, they kept the Passover. So it was a very memorable experience for the children of Israel. You know, and so you got asked the question, well, why were they, you know, focusing on refurbishing the temple, you know, and rebuilding it? Um, it would fit if that was a jubilee year and they were not planting all these farmers would have the year free and you know what better usage of your time than to repair the temple right the other date this one to me is a lot more conclusive is uh in ezekiel 40 verse 1 in the five and twentieth year of our captivity in the beginning of the year in the tenth day of the month, in the fourteenth year after that the city was smitten, in the selfsame day the hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me thither. So the twenty-fifth year of their captivity, the year began on the tenth day of the month, the tenth day of the seventh month. And we know from Leviticus, 23 that the only time or, and 25 that the only time that happens is on a jubilee year. The year begins. Yes, the jubilee year begins on the 10th day of the 7th month. Normally the year began on the 22nd day. On the last great day. So so the fact that they're calling the 10th day of the seventh month the beginning of the year signifies to me that this must be a jubilee year for the children of Israel. 
it doesn't say seven months. No, but it says in the beginning of the year. We know the year's end was in the seventh month at the Feast of Ingathering, which was reckoned as seven days long. <coughs> and the eighth day was not part of it. And the eighth day is known as the New Beginnings. And so the eighth day would have been the first day of the new year. Yeah, and that occurred on the 22nd day of the seventh month. So the, the first, in the beginning of the year, would have been the 22nd day, not the 10th. Except for on a Jubilee year. Yep. So, oh, can you guys see that? No. Uh, um, that's the diagram that I drew up here earlier um, with the kings, uh, uh, Jehoiakim, and this line here is Nebuchadnezzar, so first, second, third, fourth is the first year of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and this is Zedekiah, and the temple or Jerusalem is destroyed right here in the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, right there. So I wish we had a bigger screen so you guys could see this clearly, but I'd say when this is done, come up and look at it, you know, to where you can see it well. But I started it in the first year of Josiah. off and distribute it. Yeah, that would be good. So the entrance to Canaan was at 2517. The first year of Israel would have been 2518. From the chronology, um, the last king's reign ended just before Josiah and three in 3333. Th and so if you take and just uh, run forward um, first through the 18th year, you find that the 18th year is on 3351. So if you take 3351 and subtract off 2518 and then divide it by 49, you'll find that the 18th year of Josiah would have been a jubilee year, according to a 49-year cycle. Then, and um, this is the 30th year that, you know, they're talking about, the fifth year of the captivity of Jehoiachin right here. So you count back and you'll find that the first lands on the 18th. So they did inclusive numbering there to get that. Okay. The idea is just to turn the lights off and our eyes will be able oh. to see that. Oh, would that work? I'm sorry. It's Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. You need a big projector. Remember how you did it yesterday? Well, that's in this here. Okay, here's my spreadsheet. Can you guys see that yeah. better? Yeah, All right, here we are. Entrance is at 2517. 
And the first year of just uh, the first year in Israel would have been 2518. Thirty-three, thirty-three would have been the year just prior to Josiah. And so 33, 33 plus 1 would be Josiah's first year, which would be 33, 34. So counting up to Josiah's 18th year, right here, gives you 33, 51. And so if you take 3351 minus 2518 and divide by 49, what you get is 17. It's evenly divisible. So from the 18th year of Josiah, using inclusive numbering, just start counting it off here, and the count increases to 14 by his 31st year, which is his last year of his reign. Then you have Jehoiakim, he starts reigning. And uh, the Jubilee cycle just continues counting, 15, 16, 17. Here's the first year of Nebuchadnezzar in the fourth year, so you can run his count. And uh, it goes up to 25 by the end of Jehoiakim's reign. Then we have Zedekiah. And it goes 26. And Zedekiah, remember the captivity of Jehoiachin, that's the first year, which was also the first year of Zedekiah. So the Jubilee cycle counts from 26 on up to 30. 30 was the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. to look at it on the slideshow. All right. So then, the other one was uh, on the 25th year of their captivity. So we just keep on counting from five on up. There's our 25th year, which is also 14 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. That's the 50th year in the Jubilee cycle. So you can see these dates are following a 49-year cycle. Does that make sense? Can you just go over it like five more times? Or six? <laughs> One more time? Okay, really quick. All right. So the entrance to Israel was on 2517. That would put their first year as 2518, which would be a Jubilee year. From the chronology, we know that Jerem, uh, Josiah began his reign in the year 33334. So here's 3333, representing the year that the last king reigned up to, just before Josiah. And so now we can take this 3333 and start adding to it, and we get to the 18th year of Josiah, that's 3351, right there. So if you take 3351, and subtract 2518, yeah. divide by 49, you find that the answer is 17. Even, which means it's evenly divisible by 49. It's an integer number. 
So the 18th year would have been a jubilee. Yeah. And that was the first year in the cycle. So when you start counting the first year of the cycle from inclusive numbering, it just starts counting up and the 31st year of Josiah would be the 14th year in the Jubilee cycle. And you have Jehoiakim, it is 11 years, so it's 15, 16, 17, on up through 25 in the 11th year of Jehoiakim's cycle at his end. And you have Zedekiah, and so it starts at 26 in his first year. And the first year of Zedekiah is also the first year of the captivity of Jehoiachin. And so running up to the fifth year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, we see is the 30th year in a Jubilee cycle. Oh, that's very cool. Ezekiel 1-1. 41. Ezekiel 1. 1 and 2. What says in the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity was the 30th year. And the 30th year of what? It's the 30th year of the Jubilee cycle going back to the 18th year of Josiah. So then from there, Ezekiel 40 tells you the first day of the year was on the 10th day. And they give that as the 25th year of the captivity. They also give it as the 14th year since Jerusalem was destroyed. That's the 50th year in the cycle. And so we can see that the 49-year cycle lines up with the three dates that the Bible has given us for the Jubilees. That make sense? Would have been forty-nine. Okay. We're right here. The sixth year of the cycle, and the fiftieth year would have been a jubilee. Never mind. Which is also the first year because of inclusive numbering. And we know that they used inclusive numbering because the, remember a normal numbering for a chronology is you start in the following year after the king takes power. And so you would say using that numbering scheme, this should have been the first year, right? From the 18th year of Josiah, this should have been the first year, which would have put it here, but it wouldn't have been on the 14th year or the 25th year, wouldn't have lined up. And so we know that they counted using inclusive numbering for the Jubilee cycle. Maybe this matches up, maybe it doesn't, you tell me. But when a when child is born, how we number it with the, with the, in America is they're born and then the whole year passes and then we have their first birthday. Right. And then, so then they're actually into their second year when they're, when they're one to be right. confusing. So, you know, the Bible's not the only confusing thing, you know, we're confusing too. But that would, and when they say, yeah, they, the Chinese start from conception. So, so wouldn't that be inclusive also, numbering? They're one when they're actually starting their second year? No, inclusive would be they're one year old when they're born. Okay. Some countries do reckon one years old when they're born. I was raised in Turkey as a missionary's kid, and over there, when the child was born, they said they're one year old. And a year later, they said they were two. And we say they're one. This is the difference. This is what Eric is talking about. So see, when a child is born over in Turkey and they say they're one year old, they were beginning their first year. 
but we count them as one year old when they end their first year. Inclusive reckoning, you start the count when they are beginning the year. Yes, yes that's what Rick is talking about, inclusive right. reckoning. It's also based on the language, just because Aleph is one, Bet is two. Hebrew doesn't have a zero. Right. You don't get a zero until the Arabic started making noise. Mm. Interesting. Yes. So it lines up only when inclusive numbering is used. So. The last slide here. Can you guys see that? Hopefully. All right. So 2518 was the first year in Canaan, which is a Jubilee year. 3351 was the 18th year of Josiah, which is a Jubilee year. And 3400, the 35th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin was a jubilee year. So if you take 2518 and simply divide it by 49, you're going to get 51.4, which means sin happens somewhere in the middle of a jubilee cycle. It doesn't line up. Like when they started counting, doesn't they didn't start counting from a jubilee cycle? It just doesn't work. And since the jubilee points back to creation, we conclude that they started counting at sin, not at creation. Does that mean the star on number one is not, not what we're going to use from now on because it should have started at sin and not creation? No. He's well, the Jubilee cycle starts at creation. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. Even though the reckoning's not working because... It doesn't work because they sin somewhere in the middle of the cycle. And then what happened? I can't well, the cycle just kept on going. Did they restart the weekly cycle at sin? No. no. Okay, but so when you say the 25, I can't see. 25. 25, 18. 18 divided by 49 doesn't work well. That's exactly correct. what are you saying there? I'm saying that it's not evenly divisible by 49. Yes. Which means then that uh, counting of time did not start at a jubilee. The uh, counting the of time. The but counting of time did not start out a jubilee. Time before that. So the which jubilee. Which is very confusing. We're trying to count time before that. No, we don't know. We just know that they sin somewhere in the middle of a cycle. We don't know how many cycles back they were created. Okay, so. So is what you were saying that. All of the Jubilees will be off by this 1.4 because of when sin came in? No. No, no. So what you're saying is that they possibly, I mean, we could just surmise, there could have been several Jubilee cycles before they sinned. We, we don't know. We have no idea. But in the middle of the Jubilee cycle of one of them, they sinned. They sinned. And then time started counting. They started counting. But God had this cycle possibly from eternity. And, yes. and it got messed up, that sin, and then the sacrifices got added, and then we started to remedy the sin problem. Would you, now, my question is, would you say that the end of time... The last jubilee falls on a jubilee cycle from creation? From creation. Or, or it's some way figured in the messy number of when sin started. 
I don't see how it, uh, the Jubilee points back to creation, not sin. So, and so the, the, the cycle isn't going to line up. So we cannot know what Jubilee cycle was at creation compared to sin. Correct. Okay, that's very interesting. So if you run the numbers from 2518, you'll find that the last Jubilee year is in 5997 because 2518 plus 49 times 71 is 5997. It's just a number, the number of ju uh, jubilee cycles, right? To where we are presently, okay? Uh, essentially. Repeat what he said. Okay, so what I was wanting to do is say, when is the last jubilee cycle before 6,000 years of sin? We know that 2518 was a jubilee year, and so what it, you do is you take 2518 plus 49 times some number that represents so many jubilee cycles from 2518. You get as close as yep, and you just keep on incrementing this number and you'll get to 71 cycles since 2518, and that lands on 5997. So if you take 59.97 and subtract off our conversion factor of 39.74 and add 1, you'll find it's 2024. But the Jubilee cycle begins. 2024 is when the year ended. And so it would start in the fall of 23. Yeah. Yes, so the Jubilee year would begin next year on the Day of Atonement in 2023. So, sure it does. Um, remember, the Jubilee cycle points back towards creation. Right. Yes. And deliverance from sin comes from God creating within us a new nature. Okay. okay. So it would make sense that the Jubilee would start on the Day of Atonement because that's when your sins are wiped out, right? And you're given a new nature. Okay. So the Jubilee starting on the Day of Atonement is pointing towards our deliverance from sin. Ellen White says that the 144,000 are sealed a short while before the time of trouble begins. But the time of trouble will be 1,260 literal days in Daniel, end of Daniel, 12, and then... Three and a half years. So would we be delivered during the Jubilee year? It couldn't be if it starts in less than a year, and then there's 1,260 days of the time of trouble, then maybe cut short in righteousness. So there's a few years left, so we would actually, Jesus would come a year or two after the Jubilee year? A few years. Free the captors? What did you say that? A few years. But if you look at the Jubilee, okay, so uh, remember when Nebuchadnezzar took power, he started attacking the nations around him, Egypt, Israel. Um, Jeremiah said the nations would serve him for 70 years. Yet there was a scaling in of the effect Right? It took a while for him to conquer Israel and Edom and Moab and Tyre and all these other nations around. But from when he first conquered Egypt, it was 70 years. So you have a scaling in of this effect, right? So I look at it as the Jubilee starts off our deliverance from sin. It starts off the 
the sealing, and the, the judgment that begins in the house of God, right? And with the living, and it starts with them, and uh, as time goes on, it eventually moves into the general world, and, you know, people keep on getting sealed one way or the other through that, and it's going to build until it culminates at the second coming where we're delivered physically. So we're not going to have the second coming on Jubilee. I don't believe so, no. Because that would be 50 more years from, 49 more years from 2023. Right. It doesn't seem possible. And so the Jubilee will happen, and then later the second coming, and because we'll know the time, but not the day and the hour. The I Jubilee the points back towards creation. And so the Jubilee cycle is not going to correspond with the second coming. Do you think it'll be 6,000 years since sin? Well, we don't know for sure. Right? Well, what do you think? Um, so I did find there's, there's a very good quote, a very good quote um, that... Ellen White has in early writings. And I, I like to keep this one in mind. Um, she's in vision and she says in early writings, page 36, then my attending angel directed me to the city again, where I saw four angels winging their way to the gate of the city. They were just presenting the golden card to the angel at the gate when I saw another angel flying swiftly from the direction of the most excellent glory and crying with a loud voice to the other angels and waving something up and down in his hand. I asked my attending angel for an explanation of what I saw. He told me that I could see no more then, but he would shortly show me what those things that I then saw meant. So it continues on. I saw four angels who had a work to do on the earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnants, then raised his hands, and with a voice of deep pity cried, My blood, Father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel with a commission from Jesus swiftly flying to the four angels who had a work to do on the earth and waving something up and down in his hand and crying with a loud voice, hold, 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 until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I heard and what the four angels were about to do. He said to me that it was God that restrained the powers and that he gave his angels charge over things on the earth, that the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds and that they were about to let them go. But while their hands were loosening and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed and he raised his hands to the Father and pleaded with him that he had spilled his blood for them. Then another angel was commissioned to fly swiftly to the four angels and bid them hold until the servants of God were sealed with the seal of the living God in their foreheads. That quote to me speaks that God, the Father, has a time where the conflict ends. And that the people of God are not necessarily ready in time. And that Christ in his mercy says, hold up, so that these people can be sealed. So when you put it in that context, this other quote of Ellen White makes a lot of sense. The Great Controversy, page 370, says, No man knoweth the day nor the hour, was the argument most often brought forward by rejectors of the Advent faith. The scripture is, Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Matthew 24, 36. A clear and harmonious explanation of this text was given by those who were looking for the Lord 
and the wrong use made of it by their opponents was clearly shown. The words were spoken by Christ in that memorable conversation with his disciples upon Olivet after he had for the last time departed from the temple. The disciples had asked the question, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Jesus gave them signs and said, when ye shall see these things, know that it is near even at the doors. One saying of the Savior must not be made to destroy another. Though the, no man knoweth the day nor the hour of his coming, we are instructed and required to know when it is near. We are further taught that to disregard his warning and refuse to neglect and refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah not to know when the flood was coming. The Great Controversy, page 370. So we are to know when the time is near, but we will not know exactly when the time is. And I believe that's because God may uh, delay it a little bit so that the people can be sealed. So I can't say, yes, that 6,000 years of sin, Christ will come. What I can say is that 6,000 years of sin, I believe, it's near. Uh, Rick, with your um, study, you've shown that um, 2027, according to the biblical record, is 6,000 years, runs out. Yes. 2027. That's correct. Okay, so we've got that study. Now, this is a separate study here that we're looking at with the Jubilees. That's correct. Now, if we take the time frames in Daniel... Chapter 12, the 1260, the 1290, and the 1335. And we, we know that, that uh, Jesus is coming in the fall at Tabernacles during this week that we're celebrating right now. If that is true in 2027, and you come back three and a half years, it will put you somewhere in the spring or late winter of 2024, That's correct. which is right in the middle of this jubilee, jubilee cycle. cycle. Not in the middle of the cycle, middle of the year the of, of the that year. jubilee. That's correct. Of the fall from 2023 to 2024. So the spring of 24 will be halfway through that jubilee year. And that will set off the Daniel 12 scenario ending with the 2027. And that's where I see that these two are really interesting to tie together between them. Now, whether, whether it's going to happen exactly that way, I mean, we don't... We don't know. We haven't seen God's writing out his calendar the exact date yet. But when you start looking at this, this is time study, this is not time setting. And so what we're doing is we're looking here and saying, you know, these are some interesting things that the Bible is pointing out, and we believe that God is going to give more and more and more information about the timing of his coming the closer that we get there. If you're looking, if you're looking for those that are looking. And, and it's a repeat of history because Simeon and Anna were looking for his first coming, and it was because of the prophecies that they were studying. It was because they were studying and God revealed to them because they were looking. Because they were looking. Right. And I think that's the same thing that's going on now. So you're right, this is a repeat. And um, so I'm finding this very interesting. This is new to us. And this is one of the things Rick started explaining to us just real briefly here just last Friday. And then when we asked, said, hey, would you come over and, and, and share this with us? And he's put this presentation in together since then. And so um, really, really appreciate this. This is really, really neat. So if I understand it correctly, God begins his deliverance of his people in, at the beginning of the 1260, which is the middle of the Jubilee year. So he, the... The beginning of the time of trouble is the beginning of the deliverance of God's people. So um, that does fit Jubilee. And then when Jesus comes the second time, that's the culmination of his Jubilee work that began in 24. Yes, yes, the beginning. Shortly yes, before. God's people are beginning to be sealed. 
at the beginning of the Jubilee year. Um, well, the 144,000 will be sealed first. So, um, yeah, at the beginning of the, somewhere around the beginning of the Jubilee, the 144,000 will begin to be sealed. So will be the beginning of the Yes, well, the time travel will start. Yeah. Which we've had right. three and a half years, which would be the 2027. Yes, the 100,000 will be sealed just before the time of trouble starts. That's what we're told. Um, just, just to go along with like the seven year cycle, like you're saying, and the, you know, the 50th year not being adding an additional year, like the inclusive numbering and everything. Um, if you look at, you know, the 457, the 70 week prophecy, if you take those as sabbatical cycles, because you know the 70 weeks is uh, prophetic weeks. So a seven year cycle would be like a sabbatical cycle. If you march out sevens there, then you'll see that there is a lot of prophecies that end on a, or that are related to a seven year cycle, like 538, um, you know, establish of the papacy, 1798, 1840, 1844, 1847, 1888 message, all these things are seven year cycles. So just looking back and a lot of the prophecies are related to a seven year cycle, just, so it's, it's pretty interesting. Oh, one other thing, and then the, I've noticed a lot of three and a half year or maybe seven year patterns too around important, um, um, you know, prof prophetic events. Of course, Jesus preached for three and a half years. You know, the Elijah message was three and a half years of famine. Um, destruction of Jerusalem, three and a half years before that was the initial siege where the Christians left after that. Um, 1840 was the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Four years later, or in the midst of the week then, you have the 1844 message. So there's a lot of kind of Elijah message, three and a half year cycles surrounding these prophetic events. Oh, one other one. Uh, the three and a half years where the two witnesses were, were dead in the streets. Talking about the French, uh, French Revolution. That was right before 1798. So that was another three and a half year cycle um, related to another um, time prophecy. Where does the National Sunday Law fit into that? Well, I believe that the National Sunday Law occurs at the beginning of the time of trouble. I believe it begins at the beginning of the time of trouble. Likely at Passover time, but... Have it in our hand. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> can, it, can it be done before we leave? <laughs> right. I've got a paper. I need to update it a little bit, um, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it can be emailed out. So, awesome. written down. Yeah, PDF. PDF. Yeah. Yeah, I need to, yeah, I need to call the end here. Folks, enjoy this? Yes, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings you have given us and uh, for what we um, were able to learn. And I just thank you for this food. Please bless and to our needs. Amen.